the pink sauce a scam? Is Jaclyn Hill going back on what she said about her lipsticks? And do I need to worry about benzene in my sunscreen? Today I'm going to give you my opinion on these as a chemist who has worked in manufacturing. Hi there and welcome back to my channel. If this is your first time here, my name is Angie and I'm a chemist who loves makeup. We are going to discuss some topics today that have been fairly big stories, one of them particularly viral, and I'm going to give you my opinion on these from my background as a chemist. This will be a fairly casual video today, not a lot of data heavy things, just my experience and my opinions. First, we're starting with the absolutely viral pink sauce debacle. If you've not heard of this, I'm going to link various videos down below, but I imagine a lot of you are familiar with this. So this one I really want to talk about because I do have a little bit of background with food. First of all, this product without any sort of like FDA oversight or registration should not have been um, distributed nationwide. It would have been better to start out just in her home state of Florida, well, that would be under a cottage kitchen law that states have in which you can sell within the state, but the caveat is you can only sell products that are low risk to consumer. And each state's gonna have their own guidelines, but typically these are jams, dry foods, things that don't have a lot of water in them. Because if something has more water or perishable ingredients in them, they are more susceptible to contamination. So you can't be shipping these all over the state and putting people at risk. Sauces would most likely not fall under that category. There was a lot of talk about how this product should not be shipped across the state, across the nation, because it contains milk. The milk being contained in there is a completely separate issue from the safety. It is a thing you need to consider, but there are ways to make shelf stable products that have dairy in them or perishable ingredients. There are a lot of measures you can put into place that will allow for the stability of the product to be shipped across the state, across the nation. Products do it all the time. One way could be pasteurization. You're killing any sort of bacteria and you are sealing it in. So that way there is no chance, unless it's a, unless that product is exposed to air, it's not gonna grow anything. You can also make these products more acidic in which is not a hospitable environment for microbes to grow, which is something that could be done with a sauce such as this. I am not very confident that these measures were taken. It was kind of developed in home and not with people who are food scientists who could help with this from what I know. That was something I saw very heavily mentioned in commentary videos with people who don't necessarily have a background on food manufacturing. And there are ways to make sure that these kind of measures that I have just described do work. In fact, if she is gonna ship nationwide, the FDA will want documented evidence. The burden of proof is on the company to show that their product is safe and the FDA will ask to see these things. You need to show that it is shelf stable. If I put this product and I don't open it for up until the expiration date, is it still gonna be safe for me to consume? If it gets shipped across the country and back, is it still safe for me to consume? Have you shown multiple times in a row that your product is not gonna grow anything? Now, I'm mentioning a lot about microbial growth. That's really one of the biggest things when we're talking about food is that it's not going to harm the consumer. There are certain things like pH and things like that. And another thing they should be actually checking for is color in these same kind of studies. Not necessarily safety wise, but for consumer experience, because let's say it ends up in a store shelf and they got one shipment of pink sauce and then, and then they have maybe two left. So they get another shipment of pink sauce and then that pink sauce is a different color than the other pink sauce. Well, that's weird. Is something wrong with that one? And that was a complaint that I did see online that people were having is that they were different colors. And that's something that should get checked with quality control because this is called the pink sauce. That is a big part to your consumer experience. They have to do this kind of thing. And it seems like she was just kind of developing this in-house, which is really great. She can develop this formula in-house, but honestly, she should have consulted some kind of company that makes these kind of sauces who could help her not only improve on the formula, but make sure that it was safe and that she had all of her paperwork in a row so she could legally distribute this to people. And I think she is collaborating 
with a company that does this now. And honestly, I would recommend that for any single person who is getting into an industry they don't know. So she is getting help with that. The one thing I do want to say when we are kind of consuming viral content like this and people are putting out their experiences online with said viral product is we kind of have to take things with a grain of salt. When I see them, I process them, I take it in. I usually don't try to just retweet it or basically like push it out so more people see it if I don't have a high confidence that it is true. And some people do lie. And it's really sad because I know I wouldn't do that, but unfortunately there are people that do that. So you have to take some of them with a grain of salt. And that's just to try to help make sure it's valid complaints that are being shared. That also being said, when these tweets do go viral with these kind of complaints, oftentimes you will see drama videos, news videos, sharing these viral complaints or consuming commentary videos, which is basically how I kind of learned more about the situation. They sometimes share things that aren't necessarily accurate. They try to do their own research, which is very hard, and they'll try to provide information that based on my background and professional experience, I know not to be correct. One thing that I did see in one video was where it was being spoken about that the FDA cannot show up to your place without a warrant. And that is just, and in fact, the FDA often shows up to manufacturing facilities with no warning. They are usually on a regular schedule so you know when you're about due, but they just show up. There's no warrant. And in fact, a lot of FDA laws and things that are being spoken about, the FDA has all their guidelines available online to search. This is how professionals find FDA guidelines is they search through their website. Someone that doesn't have experience in that wouldn't know that. But then we that's why we have to be careful of what we're showing and things that I don't know from a personal level, I do try to find sources for enlist the help of people who are more knowledgeable. So that's another thing to take with a grain of salt is commentary videos. Moving on to our second story, we're gonna talk about the Jaclyn Hill Harry lipstick. If you've been a previous subscriber of mine, you probably stumbled across one of the videos where I talked about the Jaclyn Hill lipsticks. And after all that, it appears that Jaclyn Hill is taking back any sort of resemblance of accountability that she had about her lipsticks. She had mentioned that she wasn't gonna let people bully her anymore about the lipsticks. She had said that whatever company she had hired had found only 2% of the lipsticks had gotten contaminated. I understand Jaclyn Hill is not gonna come out and say, my products hurt people, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, I didn't have any issues with it. The only thing I had found was like a little undissolved particle that seemed like something that just didn't get milled properly. But that was what I had. I didn't have any of the fuzzies or anything like that. Now she's saying only 2% of them got contaminated, I'm guessing with these fuzzies. I have a lot of issue with how we came to this 2% number. It's hard to assess how this number could have been determined. There are a few ways that I would go about testing this or assessing this 2% number. One of them would have to be complaints made to the customer service department about lipsticks. And if two out of every 100 people had complained, that's not necessarily a good figure. That should be taken as a, that's a minimum because not everybody's gonna send in a complaint. Like some of them, if you see that it's a little fuzzy, oh, it's no big deal, maybe that was for me. Maybe they already saw that they were getting a refund, so they figure, well, what was the point in me emailing customer service? You can't, that's not a good way to assess it. And also, the lipsticks also sold out. One way you could have tested this as well as if, you didn't sell out of lipsticks, which the lipsticks did. One way that you'd be able to assess it, which if they did, you would get whatever leftover you had of the lipsticks and maybe check through every single one of those lipsticks and see how many of them had fuzzies. There was a reasonable sample size, I would say at least like, at least 100, at least 100. And if only two of out of those 100 had fuzzies, then maybe you can make that 2% argument. The next way you could have done this is making a whole nother batch doing a 100% inspection, checking every single one of those as if you were gonna sell them. But alas, I don't think any more of them were produced. So I'm really curious how we got to this 2% number. I don't think it was a very wise move for her to mention this. I know a lot of people still bring up her lipsticks, but she has released quite a few products which I know that people have been happy with. For instance, 
I really enjoyed her highlighter. Her highlighter is really nice. The lipsticks launch was so long ago, I don't know why she's still talking about it. She always talks about moving forward, but instead she just keeps bringing up these lipsticks. She rolled back any sort of resemblance of accountability she might have had. Moving on from that, the last story we're gonna talk about is Banana Boat having to recall their scalp and hair sunscreen. This sunscreen is a spray sunscreen that goes on your scalp and hair, as it would be described. Tra that was found to have traces of the contaminant benzene. Benzene is very reactive due to a shape. This is what it looks like, and it can be very harmful. And it was voluntarily recalled by Banana Boat after finding traces of benzene. Since we were talking about sharing information responsibly, I am linking below the recall statement that was put out by the FDA. This is the most direct source to share something from other than Banana Boat's website. If you have questions about the recall, I would recommend looking into that. That being said, there have not been any adverse events that have been shown from this. Based on an assessment, it is considered low risk that you would develop adverse reactions due to the amount of benzene in the product, the method of applying the product, and the route of exposure to the product. That being said, we have already seen this happen once. We saw this happen with some aerosol hairsprays, dry shampoos. I made a video about this, so I will link that up here and down below in case you wanna get more in-depth information about the whole benzene thing. My suspicion is that this is due to the propellant. These are things like propane, isobutane. I haven't looked at this product specifically, but that is what I noticed in the last product is it most likely came from the propellants. The major risk of a spray on product like this is if there is benzene in them, you could inhale it and that's a very direct route of exposure, which is probably why there is an overabundance of caution and these are being recalled. After that first recall of all the hairsprays and the dry shampoos, I was not surprised that there is now a second one. And now that there's a second one, I think we should fully expect that there will probably be more companies that will end up having to recall the products for a similar reason. And in fact, it would be really nice if there were companies that would come out and be like, hey, we tested our product for benzene. It doesn't have any benzene. That would actually be kind of nice because then we might know which propellants are causing this. And because this is an over-the-counter drug product, the FDA does have a lot more oversight than they would with like the hairsprays. That being said, I would not be very surprised if for these propellant type of ingredients, there is a testing procedure that the FDA either recommends or the FDA is going to require of these type of propellant ingredients and these products overall. And honestly, I think that would be a great move if that does happen because that will make sure that these products are safe. The cosmetic industry can then adopt that test method that was developed for those and use it for their own products to ensure that their products are safe. We may realize that certain propellants we probably shouldn't be using because they would be more likely to contain benzene. I hope that you found this video informative. Please let me know if you have any questions regarding the pink sauce, the benzene, or just give me recommendations down below if there's any products that you specifically want me to talk about or topics that you want me to discuss. But I know I've been gone for a while, but we're gonna try to get back into it. And I hope that you, and do not forget to click the, and please before you go, and please before you go, make sure that you hit the subscribe button. I would love if you would stick around and we can learn more about the makeup. And we, I would love if you would stick around and we can learn more about the science of makeup and skincare together. And with that, I will see you in my next video. Bye.